<laughs> howdy, how are you guys doing? Just five seconds ago, we did a reaction to the American border at Health Two Colonies, chapter one. So if you haven't seen that, you know, go check that one out. Uh, now we're gonna check chapter two. Uh, you know, we were basically left with the history of how the U.S. was formed and how Mexico was formed and how they were different because their parents, the U.K. and Spain, wanted them to be different or, or you know, build them different. So right now, uh, we're gonna go chapter two, Leviathan and the tyranny of cousins. I have no idea. While the English colonies started taking shape, a civil war raged in England, and during its chaos, an Englishman called Thomas Hobbes wrote a book about what he believed a state should be, called Leviathan, from which we know that he would have disapproved of what was happening in the English colonies and would have preferred what happened in the Spanish Americas. Oh, really? The Leviathan is an enormous biblical sea monster before which all human efforts to resist and fight are futile. And in Hobbes' mind, this is what the ideal state ought to resemble, a powerful force of nature, resistance against which was to be futile. If all bowed before and contributed to the establishment of a powerful state, that state would in return secure the well-being of all who were part of it. That through a collective effort, a collective good and security could be assured. And also above all, hold at bay what Hobbes saw as the only alternative to the Leviathan, anarchy and statelessness, or as Hobbes put it, war, and described as continual fear and anger of violent death, and the life of a man, <laughs> solitary, Holy shit. poor, nasty, this is some dark British, stuff, and short. The actual terror of anarchy, sure anarchist stateless disease. societies, or war, or whatever you wish to call it, according to Hobbes, however, does not come from a continuous violence of masses of all against all, but consisteth not in actual fighting, but in the known disposition thereto. During all the time, there is no assurance to the contrary. And a lack of structure to provide the passions that incline men to peace, a fear of death, desire of such things as a necessity to comedious living and a hope that their industry will obtain them. Statelessness, in Hobbes' view, could neither provide security for one's safety nor the security and stability for industry, labor, and commerce to exist and prosper. What Hobbes proposed in its stead was a commonwealth, state, or great leviathan, a collective good and order that all would render themselves under its authority and would bring... So, kind of like the Holy Roman Empire? I mean, this is what this looks to me, the Holy Roman Empire good and order, that all would render themselves under its authority and would bring prosperity and security to all. Hobbes, however, was wrong. The great leviathan state under whose authority all shall render themselves turned out to be amongst one of the most horrific monsters ever to be inflicted upon mankind. Order within itself is no guarantor for a universal oh, common Jesus. good. A powerful state with an efficient bureaucracy can just as well use that bureaucracy to create lists of people to be deported into death camps, Damn. to facilitate depriving a region of basic food supplies and thereby intentionally starve millions, or create a society of surveillance and mass policing in which nobody is safe from the Sounds Leviathan familiar. itself. Power is in itself type, not eh? an inherent good, neither is being a state an inherent good, let alone are these guarantors of social and economic success. A society of laws is only worth as much as its laws are worth, and the Leviathan that was the Spanish Empire provided little prosperity or economic success for its population or security. But more importantly, Hobbes was wrong about stateless societies. Stateless societies can exist and provide both the security Ooh, and stability likes. for people to prosper and live. The first communities of humans probably started out as family structures amongst hunter-gatherers. These would then band together with other families to form bands. When those bands settled during the agricultural revolution, they stopped traveling vast stretches of land, stayed put in one place, developed myths and religions around the landmarks and personalities of the place, invented stories in both identifying and religious terms to explain their own existence, developed unique cultures 
cultural expressions, and through this formed into tribes. In these settled tribes, the self-sufficiency of the hunter-gatherer was abandoned. A segmented social structure developed in which each and every one was dependent upon the other, and each segment of society was a replica of another segment. The fabric that holds these societies together like is event. family and social norms, traditions and religions. Such societies are frequently romanticized as anarchist utopias, as places of freedom, solidarity and individualism. Places in which terms such as prosperity are meaningless as all prosper together with the group or alone through themselves and their own labor. <laughs> but are they? The New World colonies of England were societies removed from the authority of the English state, societies of norms, traditions and religion. And what were these norms, traditions and religious dictates? Puritan New England was a deeply intolerant society, a place where Quakers had their noses cut open, ears sliced off and the face branded with the letter H for heretic, so they could be easily identified if they dare return to their community. A place where communal judges handed out the death penalty for adultery, blasphemy, idolatry and sodomy. A place where Captain Thomas Kemble was put in the stocks because after returning from a three-year voyage he had publicly kissed his wife. In Virginia, the norms and dictates were those oh. of the landed gentry and tra- <laughs> Oh, that's bad luck. He publicly kissed his wife and he died. Oh, well, you know, I guess he, does, he didn't die, right? But yeah, you can see my man wasn't pretty happy about the whole thing. His wife. In Virginia, the norms and dictates were those of the landed gentry and transplant aristocracy, a place where the punishment for insulting such an aristocrat was to receive 50 beatings by 20 men, have your tongue <laughs> drilled through, a fine worth 10 years of a farmer's income, followed by being banned for life from Virginia. In the mountains of Appalachia, the norms that dictated life were those of family clans feuding and fighting over scraps of land and livestock, with maimings, killings and subsequent retaliatory actions in a cycle of continuous self-propelling violence. And in the Deep South, the social norms dictated that the black man was a subhuman, that the black woman had no right to defend herself against the violations of her body by a white master, that it was the white man who has to be both the owner, superior and master of all black men, because it has always been that way, because the Bible says so and because that is simply the norm and tradition of the white man's civilization, a place where it was the norm that a cruel and horrendous fate befell black men unfortunate enough to be accused of even just looking at a white woman the wrong way. A stateless society is a society of social norms and or a society of God. It therefore can be and is more than likely a society in which the most fanatical dictate what these norms are, be it in the name of King Jesus or under Sharia. It can also be a tyranny of cousins in which arbitrary notions of family honor frame your life's purpose and limitations. It can be yeah. a society in which what the norms are is dictated by the whip hand and the bloodhound. In short, a society in which what the norms are is dictated by those with the bigger Damn, guns. It can be the society of the tribal chief, whose oh, whims yeah. and neuroses dictate everyone's life. Therefore, a stateless society can be every bit as tyrannical, as horrendous and as cruel as any leviathan. Wow, this is weird because of what's happening literally as we're talking. You know, the, the whole Afghanistan deal, I'm not going to talk about it because I'm way too ignorant to give an opinion on it, but, but yeah. But yeah, this was very... A society of fanatics, violence and slave owners that requires every bit of obedience. While watching, you may have started thinking over how this is almost a metaphor for interactions and social media, where rules are vaguely defined and the resulting norms are dictated by those who can scream for cancelling the loudest. Or is it the other way around, that social media companies are domineering dangerous leviathans in whom we invest too much trust? And please, if you do, hang on to that metaphor, because what I present here is not a binary. State and stateless entities are known to coexist, to cooperate, but also to compete with each other. 
The story of the United States is the story of a loose confederation of semi-stateless entities that struggled over centuries to unify and evolve from being societies of norms into a singular society of laws. A leviathan, if you will, but a leviathan in competition, conflict and cooperation with its internal, disparate groups of semi-stateless entities of norms. However, more relevant for us is the story of the Spanish Empire and the Americas, which, as this video will show, is the story of a collapsing leviathan. Ouch. Oh, chapter 3. El Norte. Alright, I guess. Our common high school history curriculum teaches us that the first Europeans to settle North America were those pioneers and pilgrims who landed in Virginia and New England. The framing of that story is within itself not true, but more importantly, it is overall factually not true. In the first decades of the 1500s, Spanish conquistadors had explored the plains of Kansas, trekked up the Colorado River and through the Grand Canyon, sailed up the coast of Nova Scotia, mapped the Pacific coast from California through Oregon to British Columbia, and ascended the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee, a century before French, Dutch, and wow. English settlers even arrived on the eastern coastlines of they North America. In 1565, the Spanish founded St. Augustine in Florida, which is the oldest European town in the United States. The I oldest the building knows. within the continental United States is the Governor's Palace in Santa Fe, built by the Spanish in 1610. The oldest building within the borders of the United States is the San Juan Cathedral in Puerto Rico, built in 1521. From 1560 onward, the Spaniards pushed north of Monterrey to found Santa Fe and Taos in New Mexico, pushed east to found Nagadoches, and pushed west to the Bay of San Francisco. The claims laid to the lands of North America were vast. You will find the occasional Spanish enclave lasting to this very day, such oh, as really? in Colorado and New Mexico, communities who still practice old medieval Spanish customs, such as symbolically crucifying a member of the community during Lent, communities <laughs> that the define I don't think that happens nowadays, but yeah, I I don't remember where I heard that a lot of the people in northern New Mexico and southern Colorado are descendants of the Spanish settlers of the area, and therefore making them the first Hispanics to ever settle the U.S. Themselves, not as Mexican, but as Spanish American, older than Mexican American yeah. communities and the Mexican identity itself, and fiercely yes. defensive and protective of their 500 year old Spanish heritage. But Spanish culture north of Zacatecas developed differently from the rest of the colony. Mexico, or New Spain, Spain, as it was known then, was the crown jewel of the Spanish Empire. It produced two-thirds of the empire's revenue. It was the most populous as well as the richest part of the empire. It was the administrative center of all of Central America, Northern South America, and the Spanish Caribbean, which created a strong uh -huh. governmental structure in its capital. Silver mines, as well as large sectors of agriculture and ranching, created an economy and class of wealthy merchants, which built a society that was wealthier than any other Spanish colony, English colony, French colony, and by the 1700s, even wealthier than the Spanish homeland itself. This wealth was hardly surprising. If you look at the wealth of the pre-colonial Americas, it is also the natives who lived in this stretch of land who were the wealthiest. The Spanish took over that society, expanded it, and prospered from it. But to the north of Zacatecas, the environment, climate, geography, and society changes. The Sierra Madre Mountains, which push out into fertile plateaus in the south, in the north stretch out into the dry Mexican highlands known as the Caparral, surrounded by dry lands and the North American desert. These lands are dry, with few rainfalls during the summer, the complete opposite of the lush tropical climate zones and jungles of southern Mexico. Total Mexico opposite. is a north-south divided country in geography, but also in society. Southern and Central Mexico's native populations were settled city-states. And, and that's from the very beginning, like this guy saying, uh, the city-states of Southern Mexico uh, were very wealthy, very vast, very populous. In the North, there were uh, very similar civilizations to the Apaches, for example, very uh, nomadic, not very populous. Uh, they didn't really form uh, city-states or empires, right? right? Like the Aztec Empire. They didn't do that. So it 
it was very different, different from the beginning. Civilizations such as the Aztecs, but go north and the arid land made this type of settlement and social organization Impossible. difficult. Here lived the Guajiltecan and the Apaches, semi-nomadic hunter-gatherer peoples who had adapted their society perfectly to the land they lived in. And along the Colorado River you found the Pueblo, a settled peoples who lived in towns and villages of up to five-story high buildings, growing peach groves and trading in textiles, also fiercely independent. When Spain arrived it was easier to take over the state structures of the south than take the north. Especially the Apaches and Pueblo resisted fiercely. These were not people who could simply be subjugated and assimilated yes. through conquest and the usurpation of their leaderships. Mm -hmm. They lived in these vast lands which include the modern day states of Texas, Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, Sonora, Chihuahua and Coahuila. And forget the modern borders. See this as a geographic landscape shaped by dry plains, plateaus, deserts and occasional rivers. A rough land that required a rough and specialized society to live in. The Aztecs may have been a society of laws, clergy, nobles, serfs, taxes and bureaucracy. Story goes that actually the Aztecs tried at conquering some of the northern tribes and they failed because it's really hard. It's kind of like the Russia of the Americas. But those who lived here were a society of norms, traditions, families and autonomy and the Spaniards chewed their teeth out on them. When the story of the Indian is told, our modern perception is dominated by a narrative of tragedy that ignores their perseverance and victories, and victories there were. Many don't know that in the wars between natives and settlers, the Spaniards were defeated in these lands. In yes. 1680, after the Spanish colonial authorities burnt Pueblo shamans on the stake for heresy and resisting the Catholic faith, the Pueblo assembled an army and kicked the Spanish Spanish army out of Santa Fe and New Mexico. The Spanish army may have been a modern and terrifying entity on the battlefields of Europe, but here in these vast borderlands facing guerrilla tactics by an enemy who knew the land like their back pocket. It was kind of like Spain's Vietnam. Pocket, they were hopelessly outmatched. Especially the Apaches would not leave the Spanish even a bit of respite, burning mines and ranches alike. The Apaches, in fact, would keep fighting for centuries against the Spaniards, Mexicans, Texans, Confederates and Americans alike and be the last native Indians to surrender in 1924. The wow, the 1924. 1924, that's less than 100 years ago. Crazy, but good for them. Spanish state never really established itself here and it never really stood the chance in the first place. So what developed in its stead here in the north was very different. The Spanish called native people gente sin razón, meaning people without reason. But unlike other colonial powers, the Spanish believed that they could be turned into gente de razón. And here in the north, they would try with a different mode of colonization after the first one had failed. For this purpose, the Spanish established missions, usually run by Jesuit Catholic priests. The Indians would be confined to these missions where they would have to convert to Catholicism, work in tanneries, mines, workshops, stables or kilns, and speak Spanish only under the threat of severe punishment. The native Indians would be called neophytes during their time in the mission, and the plan was for the priests to civilize and turn them into God-fearing Catholics loyal to Spain and then release them. However, the priests who ran these missions made considerable profit with their unpaid workforce, which consequently provided an incentive to never actually declare any of the Indians brutalized in the missions to be civilized. 18 such missions existed in New Mexico, 20 in Texas, 8 in Arizona and 21 in Alta California. And French explorers who visited such a mission described them as Everything reminded us of a Caribbean slave colony. We mentioned this in pain because the resemblance is so perfect that we saw men and women loaded with irons, others in stocks, and at length the noise of the strokes of a whip struck our ears. These missions would form the modern towns of Tucson, San Antonio, San Diego and San Francisco. The natives in essence were slaves, many consequently ran away, many more died under the brutish conditions and the Spaniards had to import more Spanish settlers to continue operations. Consequently, this new mode of colonization also failed. 
These Spanish settlers were supposed to live under the same strict rules and regulations as were in place throughout colonial Spain. Spanish settlers in Texas were forbidden from trading their goods with other colonial states, even other Spanish colonies like Cuba or California, or to even ship them from their own Gulf Coast. Instead, they were supposed to ship their cattle hides down cobbled roads to Mexico City, from which they were then sold back to Spain. A restrictive and highly regulated economic model intent on stifling any economic self-sufficiency that could rival that of the Spanish crown. But it increasingly didn't work. Spanish settlers simply left those towns, built their own ranches and farms, and up here in the north, the Spanish state was simply not strong enough to stop them. These independent and self-sufficient ranchers tracked along the Gulf Coast into the French colony of Louisiana to trade their cattle and leather with the French merchants of New Orleans. They would even sell them along the coast to British and Dutch traders in open defiance of the Spanish state and its laws Ooh, against local independent Spain. commerce. Just as with the English companies in Virginia and English aristocrats in the Chesapeake Bay, the colonial mode of operation of conquest, subjugation and forced labor simply didn't work in the northern fringes of New Spain from Texas to California. The Spanish had to provide incentives for the cooperation of their subjects. They did so by offering payment in exchange for labor in mines and workshops. This created a wage-based labor economy that spread south from the north and gradually started replacing the feudal economic order of serfs and their masters. In the south, this created an increasingly wealthy class of merchants, while in the north, separate political orders and social structures started to evolve. In the absence of the Spanish state, people started organizing in disparate communal structures, usually with the wealthiest member of the community being at the top. That person, usually the owner of the largest ranch or mine, would become the benefactor of the community, organize festivities, provide charity and settle disputes. The term used to describe and address these individuals became patron. A divide started to develop between a south with its densely populated core, the seat of the government and center of administration, and the north on the periphery, its society more decentralized and self-sufficient. A divide that in many ways continues to this day and is frequently yeah. ignored by outsiders. A society of peoples who were distant from the bishop. Mm, it's very, very similar. Like so similar, Me Southern Mexico and, and, and Northern Mexico are very different. Uh, the, the people are very different uh, in the north. The north of the descendants from Spaniards, uh, while in the south it's mostly mixed between natives and Spaniards. Uh, and in some regions, it's just Native American. Period. Oops, governors and tax collectors of Southern New Spain and Spain itself where people married without the approval of Catholic ceremony or priests, where different decentralized religious practices evolved distant from Catholic doctrine, a society that became majority white Spanish settlers in contrast to the large mestizo population in the south, a society with a deep distrust of centralized state structures, authority and government, in which the family and its values and traditions mattered more the North would significantly shape Mexican but also American society. This is the place where the Wild West, as we know it in popular culture, was actually born, and not in the United States. It was here where the first cowboys, called vaqueros, led cattle herds on trails to markets both South and North. Their language permeated across cultures to be found within Spanish loanwords in the English language into which they were adopted when American settlers started moving west a hundred years later and encountered them. Lazo, La Riata, Chaparreras, Rodeo, Vaquero, Mesteño, Bandolera, Estambeda and Rancho. The Americans wow. merely adopted the frontier. Mexico was born in it, molded by it. It didn't leave the frontier until it became the annexed. Frontier. Chapter 4 Un paso adelante y dos pasos atrás. It is really hard to tell why revolutions happen. 
even more so retrospectively. Most people who claim to know are motivated by their own desired outcomes. For one, there is never such a thing as just one reason. A Tunisian fruit vendor may set himself ablaze in protest, but the reason this incident became a spark that lit a revolution had been decades of economic mismanagement, corruption, police brutality, state repression, a political leadership that was both out of touch and arrogant, a disaffected youth, unemployment, foreign education, the free spreading of information through the internet, and the list goes on. The same is very much true here. I could spend an hour talking about why the Spanish colony of New Spain became Mexico, but I won't. I am pointing this out though because I don't want you to believe that the reasons I list in this short video are the only ones. When Spain built its American empire, its first and foremost interest was gold and silver. Money. And that is what it got out of the colonies. Later, it would add sugar and tobacco to the list of imports from its colonies in the Caribbean. But everything else was mostly left behind. Economies around other products, from leather to meat to wood to all the other basic commodities and raw materials that you can think of, consequently started to develop. And it was those economies that contributed to a substantial growth of wealth in the colony of New Spain. Boss. To such an extent, <laughs> in fact, that New Spain eventually became wealthier than Spain itself. And that was eyed with increasing nice. envy by Spain, who when the Bourbons became kings in the 1700s, started implementing taxes and regulations to get its own share of that cake. It sent companies such as the Gipuzkoan Trading Company to the New World to seize control of these independently evolving markets. This is when the first murmurs and desires for independence began in the Spanish Americas, from Argentina to Peru, Colombia to Mexico. The wealthy class of traders and the newly formed social elites didn't like giving up control over their revenue. Unlike yeah, that was basically what happened uh, when it comes to the revolutions of Latin America. It wasn't, the, it wasn't that the peasants or the Native Americans rose up against the Spaniards. It was pretty much the Spanish Latin American elites who fought the Spanish elites. Like in the British Americas, Enlightenment values and philosophies didn't play as much of a role in the American autonomy struggles. And Most the, yeah, revolutionaries exactly. were part of social elites, elites who wished to first and foremost keep their social status and power. And their conflict with Spain originated from that desire. One thing is certain, the spark that lit the fuse to revolution happened here in Europe. When Napoleon invaded and Napoleon. occupied Spain, Spain then allied itself with Napoleon. This resulted in a British blockade of Spanish trade on the oceans, which yes, severely yes. hurt the bottom line of the Spanish-American elites and consequently angered them. Adding to that, the pro-Napoleonic Spanish government favoured the abolition of slavery and end to indentured servitude. The tunes of liberty that were sung by France and consequently in a Spain allied with France were something that deeply worried the Spanish-American elites. In 1805, the British sank both the French and Spanish fleets in Trafalgar, greatly diminishing Spanish naval power and subsequently its ability to connect and to police its American colonies. Then in 1806, the British invaded the Rio de Plata in modern-day Uruguay and Argentina, where they were defeated not by a Spanish, but local armies and militias. That event showed the Spanish-Americans that they were capable of building an efficient and... Yeah, their victory was important because the armies inside the country were like, whoa, 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 we can defeat the Europeans? We didn't know, but now we know. And, you know, we might as well start using all the armies that we have, especially now that, that Spain is pretty busy with everything that's going on in Europe. So you can you can say that Napoleon is the father of all Latin American countries because he sparked the revolutions. And even though it seems very far away, you know, Mexican history and French history, they're pretty tight at that point. And in Mexico, at least you learn or you're supposed to learn. French Revolution and why it happened and how it happened and then you learn about the Bourbons and Spanish taking over uh, Spain and you know the eventual reaction in the colonies you know the, the, the elites were pretty fed up with the Spanish with Spaniards at this point so they just needed an excuse to take over and this victory showed that oh Europe, the Europeans are not invincible 
they can be beaten. Well commanded military force by themselves without the Spanish. And that they were By the way, uh, this flag, this is the earliest Mexican flag. Capable of defeating a powerful nation. Then, Spain had enough of France, rebelled and sided with Britain against Napoleon, which, ironically, brought an additional crack in the relationship between it and its Spanish colonies. Because suddenly, Spain ended its century-old trade embargo with Britain. Spanish-American ports opened for British ships, and British cities opened for Spanish-American goods. And the profits kept piling up as a result. As a result of that, the merchants and elites of the Spanish Americas started asking questions over why this embargo had been in place in the first place. If it would return at the end of the war, and how much more they could make if they had sovereignty over their own trade policies as colonies, or maybe as sovereign states. The Napoleonic War in Spain, or Peninsular War, was an exceptionally savage, cruel and brutal war. A conflict that left a million dead, and the Spanish nation in smouldering ruins. The treasury was empty and the nation was in debt. The administration and power of the Spanish state had collapsed. The once so mighty and feared Spanish army had been humbled and crushed by the French. The war had in the end <laughs> been won by guerrillas and a British expedition of Scottish and Irish troops. Spain was left weak wounded, broke, and battered. And in this moment of weakness, the Spanish restricted trade with Britain again, angering the elites of the Spanish Americas, and then decided to squeeze even more out of their colonies, which angered them even more. Adding to that, the post-war Spanish government formed a parliament called the Cortes and demanded the introduction of a parliament in a constitutional monarchy with an end to all special privileges, an end to slavery and the abolition of all special privileges in a feudal society, something that was unacceptable to the colonial elites. It would, however, be untrue to frame the revolution that followed as a revolution of colonial elites only. Spain intended to restrict the power of the Catholic Church in New Spain, forcing Spanish bishops upon the people while local American priests swelled in the lower ranks amongst the poor, who increasingly preached against the power of the Spanish crown in religious affairs in the Americas throughout the lower classes. Spain had exiled the Jesuits from its colonies, who ran most of the educational institutions, thereby attempting to seize yeah, control. This is important, especially because now in Mexico, a lot of the private universities are Jesuit universities. So, yeah. ...of New Spain's educational institutions. And in the north, a people and society who had already much autonomy and who became increasingly known as the Nortenos and who didn't like being told or what Northerners. to do by Mexico City in the first place wanted to be told even less by a far away Madrid that now sought out to gain control over their lives. The revolution that broke out in 1810 is a complex and fascinating story, one which would burst the frames of this video and which I hope we shall instead cover in a video about Mexican history specifically one yeah, day in the future. Yeah, I'm waiting for that What one. you need to know for this video is that it was an incredibly savage war, a war of burning towns, pillaged lands and massacres. The 11 year long war for Mexican independence was more brutal and vicious than any of the other American wars for independence. It left half a million people dead, which is almost as much as the victims of all other American wars for independence combined. The Spanish were desperate to not let go of one of their most important, if not the most important colony in the Americas, and Mexico. consequently fought this war with an attitude of either achieving total victory or burning the country to the ground, which, as they increasingly lost, they increasingly did. The Mexico that was born out of this in 1821 was not a republic but an empire, a monarchy governed by the former colonial elites who saw themselves as the legitimate rulers of an enormous empire stretching from the Bay of San Francisco to the jungles of Panama. But this was also a Mexico that was weak, in ruins, broken, unstable and absolutely not in any position to enforce any of these claims. The people living in those lands as well as outside would take advantage of that. 
the newly independent Gran Colombia persuaded Panama to join its federation, and when the former Spanish provinces of Central America declared themselves independent as the Federal Republic of Central America, Mexico invaded and occupied the place, but could never really establish full control over it. Within two years of independence, the Mexican monarchy collapsed, a republic was born, and Central America became the Central American Republic again, which however itself was just as unstable and eventually fell apart as outsiders took advantage of it. But that is a story that deserves its own video, eventually. The newly independent Mexican Republic was ruled by a succession of mediocre and increasingly less qualified sets of authoritarian generals, veterans of the War of Independence, and by and large interested in maintaining their own wealth and power. Politics in Mexico, as well as how political power in Mexico was exercised and perceived, developed very differently from the United States. In the newly formed United States, politicians were increasingly beholden to their electorate as public servants. In contrast to that, politics in the Mexican republics of the 1800s, which were in the end mostly military juntas and dictatorships, was about securing your own power and interests. An elitist club, reserved for society's elites to squeeze what they could out of the country. The economic structures that developed out of this were also vastly different. In the United States, the economic structure that developed was an inclusive and open one, a capitalist system in which anyone could open business and do business on their own terms. The economic structure of Mexico were an exclusionary capitalism, and its institutions reserved for a select few people at the top of society. Even today, you went even into today. Mexican politics as a wealthy man to secure your assets and not for the good of the community or country. Mexico became the kind of country where the governor of a state happened to also own the largest mining complex in the state. His yeah. uncle owned the largest ranch estates of the state. His brother was appointed the chief justice of the state. His cousin was appointed the state chief of police. And his business partners became the various ministers of the state. A kleptocratic state structure where personal interests of ruling elites mattered the most. The legacy of which, to large extent, continues in modern Mexico to this day. Mexico in many parts still is a country where people go into politics not to serve their communities and country, but to enrich themselves. Not very different from the Cachiques of the colonial era, in fact, many of these powerful men were and are a direct inheritance of that system. And there was one part of Mexico in particular where this type of government system was increasingly unpopular. The North. The Nortenos didn't like being told by Spain what to do. They didn't like being told by colonial elites what to do. And they now didn't like being told what to do by the new powerful elites of Mexico City. The Nortenos lived for most self-sufficiently in their communities of ranchers and farmers stretching from California to Sonora to Texas. They had a way of life that had evolved throughout the last centuries that they wished to keep. And during the first decades of Mexican independence, the powers to be in Mexico City also ignored and neglected them. The sparsely populated lands of California were attempted to be used as a Mexican prison colony. When California governors requested funds and materials to improve the few cobblestone roads that existed, Mexico City sent them boatloads of convicts and kidnapped southern Mexicans to build those. However, since California had not the resources to control and manage such, these penal laborers tended to break free, roam the lands, plunder existing towns, and then settle out of reach of Mexican authorities. This prison labor system had developed in southern Mexico, where when the state ran out of funds for infrastructure such they as roads, the government just used the army to kidnap thousands of innocent Mexicans and forced them to build those projects. A system which was continued by Mexican governments way up into the early 20th century. Despite the chaos of the first decades of independence, the Mexican state had still inherited the powerful colonial government institutions of the Spanish Empire and could therefore still enforce this in the south. But in the north, just as with the English prison colony system in Virginia, it simply didn't work. The best example of how destabilized, kleptocratic and broken Mexican governance was in the first 50 years of its existence is by following the career of Santa Ana. Santa oh. Ana was the son of a colonial official and soldier in the Spanish army. Probably the most infamous man in Mexico, in Mexican history, the man who is to be blamed 
for the loss of Texas, the loss of California, and pretty much everything else in between. So yeah, a very hated man. Uh, this is probably the most hated dude in Mexican history, and we have a lot of assholes. Army in New Spain. When the but, uh, fun fact, I think his leg, he lost his leg, and the leg is buried somewhere. And I think maybe you can go actually visit his his leg. Spanish started losing the war of Mexican independence, he switched sides and helped establish the Mexican monarchy. He became president of Mexico in 1833, but after a few days handed the presidency over to Gomez Farias, who was supposed to be acting president while real power remained with Santa Ana. Farias, however, was only president for two weeks, after which the presidency came back to Santa Ana, who again remained president for less than a month and then returned the presidency to Gomez Faria. The two men continued this continual exchange of the office of president for two years, which they did as part of schemes to enrich themselves. By 1835, the scheme fell apart and the different son of a colonial official and member of Mexico City's elites, Miguel Barragan, became president. However, Santa Ana didn't quit and became president again in 1839, 1841, 1844, 1847, and 1853. In total, he was president of Mexico 11 separate times. During his terms, he was exiled from Mexico five different times, presided over economic kleptocracy, over he substantial losses in territory, and two disastrous military defeats. In total, between 1824 and 1867, Mexico had 52 presidents. None of them were elected, all were members of the country's business and military elites, all ruled through military juntas, and all spent their time in power preoccupied with trying to enrich themselves and their friends at the expense of the rest of the country. Over this period of time... <coughs> Imagine that. I mean, for, the, for its first 50 years, Mexico didn't have a president that cared about Mexicans. Like that is the base of it. That is the the whole thing. The first presidents of Mexico didn't really care about the people. They cared about the, their businesses and their friends, and, and they had they didn't really care about the country itself. So it's very hard to develop when that's your situation. In the U.S., on the contrary, I think you know. Uh, a lot of the, the history of U.S. presidents are very humbling and very nice, and, and a lot of them come from not elite backgrounds. And I don't know the backgrounds of all U.S. presidents, but you can find a lot of them. For instance, and talking about Mexico, James K. Polk, if I'm not mistaken, he was he was born in poverty, if I'm not mistaken, either North Carolina or Tennessee, and he defeated that poverty and became president. I, you know, I like the history of James Polk. Abraham Lincoln was born in a shack in, in Illinois or Kentucky. And so yeah, that's the difference. And Mexico lost control over large parts of the country. The once powerful government administrations of the Spanish Empire well, started to fall apart. The ability of the state to enforce the law decreased. Taxes could no longer be efficiently collected. Corruption was rampant. How and what laws were enforced was arbitrary and dependent on who you were and what your social status was within this society. Even today. Separatist movements emerged in Texas and Alta California that successfully split off, and several more emerged in Sonora, Baja California, Yucatan, and along the Rio Grande. The resulting revolutions, uprisings, rebellions, and civil wars, without counting wars with outsiders, killed more Mexicans than American deaths in all American wars combined, and left much of Mexico in ruins as the government sent out armies to brutally crush and burn all dissent. In simple terms, this was a mess, a complete disaster. A disaster that continued almost throughout the entire history of Mexico throughout the 19th century, made worse by a French invasion and occupation from 1861 to 1867, which further yep. destabilized the country and eroded the institutions the of the occupation. state. The Mexican Republic, to emerge out of the ashes of the war with France, was even less capable of holding it all together. The economy was by and large owned by the elites who created this mess, with no room for growth or innovation or even just economic participation in entrepreneurship by individual citizens. Mexico is in the end lucky to even still exist as a yeah. nation state after the 19th century that it experienced, and that it didn't just fall apart completely and was absorbed by outside forces.
That is not to say that those outside forces didn't try. Oh, they did. They really are oh, to be continued. That's Thank it. Thank you for watching. If this is over, wow, that was actually not that bad. I mean, I, it, it's an hour long, but I didn't feel like an hour. Whew. It's so I guess you can find the rest of the videos where I'll figure it out. Hey, that was pretty good. I don't know if you guys are still watching, but I really enjoyed the video. It was really uh, insightful. And usually, I don't know, you know, for you Americans, for the ones that are still watching, uh, tell me how it is, because usually you don't see the two countries' histories linked like that. You don't really learn the history of those of the countries together, the U.S. and Mexico. It's the same in Mexico. You only learn Mexican history. And in America, I, I'm guessing you only learn American history. But it's really interesting when you kind of combine them together and it sort of makes a lot more sense and, and you sort of understand a lot more things, uh, first of all, about the other country, but about your own country as well. And I've always said it, uh, Mexican history is not Mexican history without American history. And in that way, Spanish history, British history, Dutch history, French history. But uh, I've always said, uh, you know, I like, you know, our stories are linked together. So, yeah, that the video was pretty good. I'm really excited to release it. I uh, hope you guys like it. And if you want part two of this video that I guess is somewhere here, uh, just let me know. Okay, 